Hello, I'm Matthew Goldstein, Chancellor of the City University of New York. Welcome to our program, CUNY Honors. We are very pleased to have the Chair of the New York State Assembly Committee on Higher Education, the Honorable Ron Canistreri, as our guest today. Ron, welcome. Ron is uh, also a member of the Standing Committees on Rules, Ways and Means, Banks, Labor, Transportation, to name only a few of his committee responsibilities, co-chair of the Assembly Intern Committee and the Democratic Assembly Campaign Committee, and chair of the Subcommittee on Transportation Capital Improvements. Assemblyman Canistrari is the Deputy Majority Leader of the New York State Assembly and last winter was named to lead the Higher Education Committee. First elected in 1988, Assemblyman Canistrari represents the 106th Assembly District, which consists of parts of Albany, Rensselaer, and Saratoga counties. No, po no stranger to public office, Mr. Canistrari's distinguished career includes 13 years as mayor of his hometown, Cahos, New York. Ron attended Cahos Public Schools. He is a graduate of Fordham College, Fordham University School of Law, and is a recipient of an honorary Doctorate of Laws degree from Manhattan College. We're so pleased that you've joined us today uh, in front of our live audience of uh, representatives of the relatively new CUNY Honors College, and we'll get to meet some of these students later in, in the show. Ron, you've had a brilliant career thus far with many, many years ahead of you in public service. What is it about public service that, that, that uh, drew you to, to do this work? You were a very successful lawyer. Was it uh, family? values that were created early in your life, uh, some wonderful teachers, a priest, I mean, who, who shaped Ron Canistrari to be the great public servant that he is today? Well, there's probably a lot of blame to go around, <laughs> but I think all of the above had certainly something to do with it. Mm -hmm. But I can recall, uh, even in grammar school, being interested in government and politics, and it uh, took a turn of its own when I went to high school, which was uh, Christian Brothers Academy in Albany. Mm -hmm. And one teacher in particular stood out in terms of energizing us on political issues of the day. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, that happened to be uh, my last year when John Kennedy was running for president, and that uh, sparked my interest, of course. Uh, but the previous convention that was the first one televised, also with Dwight Eisenhower, interested me mm -hmm. when I was in high school. So it was... Uh, something early on that I felt uh, I wanted to, in a sense, change the world uh, and make things better. And it's something I always wanted to do. I had some doubts in my junior and senior year of college, thinking maybe I should mm -hmm. reassess it. Was it something I was doing because I always wanted to and not really thought it through? Or, you know, so I rethought the whole plan at that time, uh, debating whether to go on to graduate school for teaching, as a matter of fact or to pursue the legal career and do the political governmental route. But uh, I decided I would take the path that I always wanted to do, and I'm glad I did. You know, in 1961 and 1962, I too was smitten by the, uh, the John Kennedy, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. He really got my interest in, in being uh, aware of public service as well. So we, we have that in common. But little did you know uh, from those very early experiences that you would probably experience the most uh, rancorous uh, uh, legislative session in, in my history. Uh, the governor proposed a budget in January of this year, 2003. Uh, the Assembly and the Senate came forward with their own budgets, which restored a considerable amount of money that was uh, taken out in the governor's budget. Uh, the governor vetoed uh, the, uh, the Assembly and Senate budget, and the Assembly and the Senate overrode the governor and created a real sense of tension between the executive and the legislative branches of government. In, in your history, do you remember such tension between these two primary branches of state government like this? No, and it 
was pretty bad. And it's still not resolved, or still the air has not been cleared. Uh, it, but it was historic in some ways, and uh, it was the right thing to do. And it wasn't just an assembly democratic uh, response, but uh, we had to join, of course, with the Republicans in the state Senate who control the Senate, as does my party in our House. Um, and we uh, negotiated a budget that was agreeable to us as legislators. Um, the governor did not expect that. He submitted his budget, which we thought was too harsh, a number of areas, particularly high red, um, and it had to be rethought and redone. redone. He did not engage himself in the process, uh, thinking we'd all have to abide by the parameters of his budget. So it was a major shift in Albany, the capital. Uh, to, he didn't expect us to reach common ground with the Senate Republicans. Uh, but under the leadership of Speaker Silver from Manhattan, mm -hmm. our great leader, and Joe Bruno from upstate, the Senate Republican leader, they fashioned, uh, with our involvement, a budget that we thought was much more fair to most New Yorkers, restored, uh, I think, $272 million in CUNY's budget alone, mm -hmm. Very significant. Uh, and then the governor vetoed. Uh, vetoed not once, twice, but 21 times. And both houses overrode all those vetoes. There have been vetoes of other bills in the past, an overriding of other bills, but never in the history of the state were budget bills uh, that raise taxes and fees. Uh, once the governor vetoed those, did the legislature ever override those? So it was quite historic that the entire package uh, that the governor rejected, basically by constitutional legal means, different vetoes, all of them were overridden. Uh, it, and it, it was uh, quite a feat. And it's changed now the dynamic between the legislative branch of government uh, and the executive. Uh, unfortunately, the governor is still the highest elected official in the state, elected by all the people, unlike all of the rest of us. There are some of his prerogatives and rights that uh, he has that we do not have, and there are some still unresolved issues. And, for example, the CUNY and SUNY capital budget, mm -hmm. the governor has not sat down with us to resolve that as part of budget language. So the conflict, uh, while we succeeded with the budget, uh, mm -hmm. passed in a more timely manner than most, mm -hmm. a better budget, there are still fallout because he has not yet come back to us to say, let's sit down and iron out some of the unresolved issues that we must do post-budget related to the budget. So there's mm -hmm. still some unanswered questions. Uh, and we're still trying to bridge that gap with the governor to ensure that some of these unresolved issues, in what we call a budget cleanup bill, gets enacted into law as soon as possible. We haven't heard as much from the governor about challenging the constitutionality of the actions taken by the legislature. Has that calmed down a bit, or is that still very much in play? And no, that, I think that was a lot of uh, public relations theatrics, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's mm -hmm. constitutional. Mm -hmm. If it were not, he'd have sued us, uh, okay. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact is, even some areas he thought were unconstitutional, like summer youth jobs, summer program mm -hmm. for youth, mm -hmm. he spent that money, even though that was part of the, quote, unconstitutional budget. Uh, and uh, funds that we appropriated to the public school systems across the state, mm -hmm. uh, he thought that was unconstitutional, but he released that money to the school right. districts. Right. So the message is inconsistent. Mm -hmm. uh, the budget is constitutional. If it were mm -hmm. not, we'd have been sued and lost. Uh, so I, that, le that legalism, that argument uh, mm -hmm. has receded uh, into the background where it belongs. You mentioned uh, that both CUNY and SUNY at this point don't have a capital budget. Uh, many of our viewers may not be as familiar, certainly as you are. Uh, you're really right at, uh, right at the foundation of, of constructing these budgets that the universities get an operating budget and they also get a capital budget. The operating budget is in place and we are now spending that, uh, that budget as we go through the academic year. But the governor proposed about a billion dollar capital program for CUNY and probably two and a half times that amount for, for SUNY. SUNY is a, 
a much bigger system. And, and that, that has been held up. What, what is your sense of why that still has not been resolved at, at this particular point? Well, I think the plan and the amount of money that's involved is great for the system. The system mm -hmm. needs updating. Uh, the physical plant and the capital end, as you know better than I, mm -hmm. uh, and some maintenance issues must be addressed. And uh, so the outlines of the capital or building program, building budget to make it more mm -hmm. simple for people, <clears throat> were very good, but there was no detail. And we as legislators right. insist sure. upon having the information in front of us. We have a constitutional duty as well right. and do not want to write a blank check for the executive, for the governor, on um, the projects that we have no involvement in. So you'd like to see this lined out, where, yes. where the dollars are, which yes. campuses, what kinds of projects, where they're going to be, and... You know, and is it fair, for example, to build uh, a new uh, recreation center at some campus when we may mm -hmm. think it's more important to upgrade the, the labs? Mm -hmm. uh, not that we want to micromanage, but certainly there must be lined out projects with some money discretionary held in abeyance for emergencies and other purposes, which is realistic. Sure. But the information must be there. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Hudson Valley Community College, for example, is in my district back in mm -hmm. upstate in Rensselaer County. I have, I think, the right to know what the plan is, mm -hmm. uh, at least for some of the dollars and most of the dollars for the building or capital project area for that campus. So the fight and the dispute is over information and our involvement as legislators to know what the detail is in the plan. And you have a fiduciary responsibility to the taxpayers to, yes. to see where the, the dollars are going to be spent and, and if they're spent the, appropriately. Let's go back to the, uh, the spring of this year where uh, the budget was finally adopted uh, for CUNY uh, in particular. We, we were challenged this year probably with the largest uh, expectation that we generate more revenue to support the operating budget than we have in recent history. And that revenue target was predicated, if you will, on raising tuition by $1,200 per FTE student uh, for New York State resident students. And as you know, Ron, uh, the assembly was violently opposed to this. We were violently opposed to it. And eventually CUNY, with a very comprehensive plan, was able to spread the revenue uh, expectations among various constituencies so that we did not have to raise tuition by more than $800 uh, for, F for an FTE student living in, in New York State. Prior to that, the, the university had not raised tuition for eight years, and there was this big spike both at CUNY and at SUNY. Some would say that that's not the most enlightened way of setting a tuition policy, that there's got to be more predictability, uh, be able to manage uh, the, the tuition expectations that students and their families would, would have to pay. Are there thoughts uh, at, at the assembly level about a different way of approaching future uh, challenges that both SUNY and CUNY might have with respect to tuition? Yes, there are. <clears throat> and of course, they're all over the ballpark as mm -hmm. to what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and our position has been uh, to fight tuition increases. Uh, um, but also not denying the campuses the operating money that they need. But let me just state first, uh, mm -hmm. as, as Chancellor, you've done an excellent job mm -hmm. with that tuition issue and how you've managed to absorb um, some of that and to enable the students to pay a lot less than at SUNY. And that you've taken the lead on that. And we had wished the SUNY uh, had followed your lead, but you have done an exceptional job in that regard. And that's been noticed, certainly, uh, in the Capitol uh, in Albany, and that's uh, to your well, credit. I thank um, you, and, and obviously you and Speaker Silver were, were very helpful in, in allowing us to, uh, to approach it in a way that, that uh, we felt would benefit our students. I think all of us agree that uh, the last constituency that uh, should be um, 
uh, required to, to help support the budget is our, are our students. See, the, the, a very bad trend, uh, as you know, in the last 10 years or so is having the, the campuses rely on the tuition money more and more as a greater percent of operating money mm -hmm. and lesser state dollars, state operating dollars in the state budget. <clears throat> that, I think, is a bad trend. Um, and we should get to the point, certainly, where tuition pays a role in the operating revenues for campuses, but the state dollars should be going up incrementally as opposed to placing so much of the burden on the funds raised by tuition. But to answer your original question as well, I don't think it's right to go without an increase for X number of years and jack it up 30, 40 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no predictability for the poor students um, mm -hmm. and for the poor administrators who have mm -hmm. to deal with this uh, and not knowing what to expect in year two, year three, year four down the road. Yeah, just uh, in, in the last eight years, now I have not been chancellor at CUNY for the last eight years, but just think about any organization yes. whose expenses continue to rise as, as they will. Uh, inflation uh, on goods and services and salaries are increasing, new contracts have to be signed, and no new revenue sure. coming in to support it. Uh, it's it's a, uh, a recipe for insolvency if you take it to its logical conclusion. And it's so, important, as you well know, to maintain quality and enhance quality uh, in terms of teaching faculty and the entire range of academic programs. We want quality, uh, and uh, that's essential for the future generations of New Yorkers that uh, we are educating. Well, I, I certainly subscribe to every word that you said in those sentences. What do you, um, what do you see uh, on the horizon now? We're about the university. CUNY is now fashioning its budget request for the 20405 budget request. It's really remarkable how this comes and creeps yes. up on you so quickly. What do you see about uh, uh, the challenges ahead for the next fiscal year? Is it going to be a, a replay of, of this very, very difficult year that we just saw uh, in Albany? I don't know. I think the fact that we did a legislative budget that uh, became the law of the state, overriding the governor's veto. I think the governor uh, learned a lesson from that as well, and I think he'll be much more involved in the process as uh, the year begins and his budget is presented. And we in the legislature do not want to do a budget that way, I might add. Mm -hmm. We much prefer a negotiated budget with the executive, with the Senate, and the Assembly. Uh, and avoid uh, the hostility that results from taking a path totally independent of the governor. Mm -hmm. So we did not want to take that road. I think there was no choice for us. But I do not think we'll see a replay of that this year because I do think politically, and I'm trying to be as objective as I can here, uh, the governor took some hits politically for uh, allowing the sequence of, of events to unfold as they did, mm -hmm. and we taking the lead in doing the budget with the Senate Republicans. So I don't think we'll see that uh, repeated this year. But we know we face some serious uh, fiscal problems again mm -hmm. with the deficit uh, looming six to seven billion dollars. So it'll mm -hmm. be a challenge. The difficulty, once again, is that last year we raised some taxes, uh, income taxes, some sales taxes, and some other fees along the route, <coughs> road, uh, tuition as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we also spent down some reserves that we had to bridge uh, the 11 to 12 billion dollar gap last year. Mm -hmm. So we do not have those reserves. We certainly can't do some of the things that we did last year to, to bridge the gap financially. Um, so we have not yet seen how the receipts are coming in in terms of state treasury. Uh, as the quarters have unfolded yet, but it's going to be a challenging year next year from a budget standpoint um, as well. And also an overlay of that, it's the political year for all of us in the legislature. We run again next year, mm -hmm. so all the more reason for us to do what we hope we can do best for our constituents without inflicting as much financial pain as, as possible. Also, um, as we um, 
we, we look ahead, uh, we are, and, and picking up on a point that you made um, earlier, the public in public education seems to be a shrinking word that more and more of the burden in supporting the operating budget is now coming on the backs of revenue that is self-generated as opposed to revenue that is supported through the general obligations of, of, of the state. That, I think, is bad public policy in, in general. There's always been a choice uh, in this country between access to a public university as opposed to access to a private university. And as the burden shifts more and more towards students through tuition, those choices become much more blurred choices. And, and I think that's something that we need to be very mindful of um, as well. The other thing that I think you're alluding to in the construction of the budget is that you're not going to have the same degrees of freedom. Uh, so much of this, but well, not so much, but a, a fair amount of this budget was built on an edifice of things that are not replicable again. And that's going to make things a little more complex uh, for this year as well. Yes, it'll make the choices more difficult. It'll make the choices uh, more difficult. And uh, we're hoping the economy turns around somewhat. We think there's evidence of it. But um, the verdict is out on that and not very encouraging, certainly. Um, revenues are up in some areas. We know that. But I think that's due to some of the tax increases that we impose that we don't hope to repeat uh, again next year. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it'll be a challenge for sure. And plus, another serious issue is aid to education in general. Primary and secondary schools are schools across the state, not the higher education area, as a result of the high courts and the state's decision mm -hmm. that basically uh, declared the formula unconstitutional and directed the state legislature with the governor to come up with a new way to fund education in the state. Um, and they were right. I think the court was right. Mm -hmm. um, we've got to redo that, and that will take more money. So we know we have to spend more money in that arena already. In the light of a tougher financial situation, we know one area we must, uh, by the direction of the Court of Appeals, act on. So that limits the flexibility and the revenues and other areas of worthwhile state activity. The, the campaign fiscal equity that, that really drove the, um, uh, the, the courts to be heard here has resulted in the governor appointing a, a, um, a commission uh, to come forward with recommendations. I believe he has said that the commission is to report out in March. Is that realistic? I mean, this is something that has been an enigma uh, for so many decades uh, in the state. Realistically, can a commission which is not fully, st fully formed at this particular point, it seems to be formed in a more iterative way, can they get their job done in March so that the legislature could um, act on those recommendations so that you could get your job done. I think it's June 30th is when the legislature is supposed to. Is the timetable going to work here? Or? I don't see how. Uh, and I don't think uh, the commission was the right way to go. Uh, number one, the governor must present his budget by the end of January. Mm -hmm. So he presents a budget not knowing the dynamics of the education formula. And uh, then the commission makes its report, whatever that is, to us and to the governor. So it's going to be up to us in the legislature, without the governor, his, his, his budget's already done, to address this issue. So he, in a sense, can take a walk. We've got to deal with it. Uh, and basically say it's the commission and legislature. Let them do it. So mm -hmm. I don't think it was the right way to deal with the problem. The mayor of New York, uh, rightfully so, was very upset. The lawsuit originated here in the city. Uh, and yet he wasn't consulted on a member for the panel, mm -hmm. for the commission. And it's not an upstate, downstate issue. Uh, sure, sure. People think it's a, it's a city issue. We're just trying to put more money into the city of New York school system. It's not the case at all, uh, because those of us upstate know a lot of our school districts, both in smaller cities and rural areas, mm -hmm. are equally poor in a formula that 
doesn't take into that into consideration with this poor upstate or downstate, that's mm -hmm. where the court said uh, more resources must go. There must be more fairness to those districts that need more. So it's not an upstate, downstate issue, number one. Um, but to set up a commission that the Speaker of the Assembly had no input on, that the Leader of the State Senate had no input on, uh, that the Mayor of the City of New York had no input on, is, is laughable. And within this time frame, to have them come up with recommendations after the budget's been submitted to us, mm -hmm. just compounds the issue. So, uh, but that will be the major issue of this legislative session, uh, that in a time of uh, tough uh, financial straits, we must redo the formula to fund education in the right. state with some commission uh, that has no power and uh, with that submitted to us so late in the budget process. Uh, that's a problem. And as you say, it's coming at a, a very inopportune time because the, the state government is in such dire straits just to fund the, the things that they need to fund with, with, without having to look at uh, further degrees of freedom uh, in this process to generate the dollars that could be quite extraordinary. See, I thought when the decision was rendered, I think it's two years ago, Judge DeGrasse here in the city, I don't think it should have been appealed. And I think we could have started working on that then when they were a little better mm -hmm. financially. But now the timing is even worse because we're less well off. And it's years after the fact, we've got to deal with it. Let's uh, turn to um, a another subject. We're, we're taping today on uh, September 11th, the year 2003, two years after the devastating attacks um, on New York and, and, uh, and in Washington, uh, major challenges being faced uh, by this city. Uh, the tension between the governor and the mayor over the refinancing of $500 million in debt service as a result of the uh, uh, financial problems uh, in the 1970s. Uh, are, we, are we moving? in the right way? Uh, do you believe in rebuilding uh, downtown New York? Uh, is, is there sufficient openness with respect to all of the important players here? I know Shelley Silver has been extraordinarily involved, the mayor, the governor, uh, the city council, the state legislature. Uh, are you optimistic that we're going to be able to get the things that we need to get done to move ahead with this uh, in the city? Yes, and I think we have to be. Uh, it's too important not only for this wonderful city, but really to our country. And we cannot lose this opportunity to rebuild uh, something that's magnificent, uh, that symbolizes uh, the freedom of this nation, the diversity of its people, and the beacon that it serves its hope for people around the world. Uh, it was a devastating attack, um, but we must do it right. Um, I think there can be more involvement, uh, as a matter of fact, by the legislature. Um, I think we could be doing even more, um, but we must have more direct help from the federal government. This is not a city-state issue, as you well know, uh, and it affects all of us as a nation uh, and our standing around the world. So it must be done right. I think the selecting process for the architecture, uh, the architect and that plan, I thought was open and it was rethought after some public criticism. I was proud of that. And, and even the final design, in fact, happened to have gone down, you know, I don't know when it was, to cast my vote after looking at it. and I like the final plan that was selected as well. And Liebeskin. Liebeskin, uh, yes, it's yeah. magnificent. And something similar to that or that itself gets done, I think we'll all be very proud of it. Ron, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure spending the first half hour. Uh, we could go on and on. There's so much to talk about, but we'll have to take a break now. When we return, uh, we will meet our uh, representatives of our Honors College. I'm sure they're very anxious to engage you uh, in a conversation. So uh, we will be back after these important messages uh, from CUNY. Thank you and stay with us, please. CUNY offers a range of educational options, whether you're interested in a senior college or a community college, a certificate program or a graduate degree. You should contact CUNY's Office of Admission Services at 
1-800-CUNY-YES or visit our website cuny.edu. Even though your cost to attend CUNY is low, the university still offers a full range of financial aid opportunities. Over 70% of CUNY's full-time undergraduate students receive some sort of financial aid. For information on financial aid, call 1-800-CUNY-YES or visit our website at cuny.edu. Welcome back to uh, CUNY Honors. Uh, we're delighted to have with us Deputy Majority Leader and Chairman of the Higher Education Committee of the New York State uh, Assemblyman Ron, uh, Assembly, uh, Ron Canistrari. Welcome again, Ron. And we're going to take some questions from uh, the audience, and I'm going to start with this young man. Tell Hi. us who you are. Hi. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you, uh, Assemblyman uh, Canistrari. My name is uh, Richard Chang of uh, Brooklyn College. I hope to become a medical doctor, and that's going to take a while. But uh, <laughs> uh, I was uh, very amazed at uh, all the titles you have. I was wondering, how do you manage all the different departments, the Assembly of Higher Education, Ways and Means, and uh, Transportation? What, is there anything from your background that helped f facilitate uh, managing these uh, titles? Well, it, uh, it is time-consuming and intense uh, <clears throat> at times, uh, but you have to balance it out. And uh, I really think the experience I had uh, practicing law uh, and also uh, as mayor of my hometown helped me because even though it's a small city, uh, that is a tough job. So. Uh, time management and, and juggling issues and people and departments and police department, fire department, library, youth bureau, parks, you know, and, and things have to be done. That certainly helped uh, as well. So, and it sounds more overpowering than it really is, believe me. Uh, you could do it too. If you can be a doctor, you can do this. <laughs> and you learn as you go. You know, I've been in the assembly now 15 years uh, and I didn't start out with all of these obligations and responsibilities, but if one express interests and likes to be involved and uh, work at it, then I am and took on more responsibility as the years unfolded. Wonderful. Thank you. You're right. welcome. Yes. Hello, my name is Sean Clark. I'm a student at Hunter College. I'm a pre-med interested in either philosophy or political science as my major. Uh, I was looking over your background and I saw that you uh, mainly were educated at private schools. Now that you have like such a place in terms of like working with the funding and uh, of, pu of public schooling, have you been surprised or been, uh, is there anything in particular that really struck you when you were first going into things about public education that you had not known or not realized before? Yes, I certainly learned a lot and have still learning. Um, my first eight years in public schools, in fact my parents didn't want to send me to a Catholic school as a matter of fact, they thought that was isolating me a bit more, but it was my decision uh, to go to a school outside of my hometown. And I really wanted to come to New York City for college uh, and ended up, fortunately, at Fordham, which I enjoyed very much. But even being here in the city for the four years of law school, four years of college and three years of law school, there was interreaction with uh, the CUNY system and, and so I learned something even as a student uh, while I was here. But as a member of the assembly before taking on the position as chair of higher ed, um, there was a great deal of exposure too when I'd, I'd come down to our Ways and Means meetings and they sometimes are at different campuses, John Jay and um, Baruch. And so there was exposure, our interaction with the New York City members and uh, most of my close colleagues are city members. So there was an educational process too. Um, but mostly I've been impressed with the students that I've met that have come to Albany, that I've been down and visiting here, and I was down at the Graduate Center uh, meeting some students uh, earlier this year, impressed by the caliber of student, the diversity, and how you juggle your time with some working and jobs and studying. That is something I didn't have to do as much, if at all, when I was in school, and that has been something that's impressed me. But I'm proud of the CUNY system, the SUNY system. I think it's the best in the nation. But we have to make, uh, we have to work on making it uh, even better. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Uh, hello. 
It's nice to meet you, Assemblyman Ghanasturi. My name is Yosef Ibrahimi, and I am a student of the Honors College at Queen's College, and I aspire to one day be a university professor. Uh, given your position on the Higher Ed Committee, are you and your co committee members considering any firm plans on how to assist the CUNY system in the development of Governor's Island as a facility for the City University of New York? And is there, are there any firm plans on the table to increase the prestige of both the CUNY and SUNY systems uh, in the upper ends of the academic research community? Wow, very good question and complex one. Uh, I wish I had the answer, but I have to say in terms of quality and image, the person that has done most with that in the CUNY system is a gentleman sitting across from me, your chancellor. Uh, because I recall in the 60s the reputation that CUNY had, and I think it suffered for a while. And now, under Matt's leadership, it's coming back to the level that uh, we had come to expect of the City University of New York. Uh, on the Governor's Island issue, we have not been that involved in the legislature, and that's um, not a very good uh, situation. It is in Speaker Silver's district, and even then, um, his involvement has been minimized. Um, so I, I don't know what uh, I've seen, the press plans in terms of Governor's Island, but the specifics of that have not been presented to me as chair of higher ed, or to be honest, as a member of the legislature yet. Uh, I think it's an exciting opportunity um, to develop that. Uh, and please, if the, the president follow through on President Clinton's commitment, and it's a new arena of rebuilding for the city and a role for, mm -hmm. for CUNY as well. Ron, I have been uh, talking a, a bit to Shelley Silver about some of the ideas that have germinated at City University regarding how we might be able to do something very exciting on Governor's Island. And, and you, you may know, uh, the students here may know that uh, the, the Governor's Island uh, Educational Development Corporation has really just been formed. Uh, and its president, uh, Mr. Lima, is uh, heading up that effort and is looking for ideas. And we've had some meetings with, with that group on some ideas. Uh, that uh, we have developed in, in consort with Columbia University and New York University. And we see some exciting opportunities in a collaborative way with some of the private universities uh, around uh, in, in New York City. And some of that is going to start uh, germinating very soon. Mm -hmm. That's exciting. So. That's exciting. Good. Next question. Well, you have the microphone. Why don't you? Uh, <laughs> and we ought to get the mic to the other side too. Uh, so, because I think there are students here that have a question. Yes. Oh, my name is Shoshana Antoine. I am a sophomore at Baruch College. My major is accounting. Hope to achieve my CPA and later on pursue law and real estate. My question: It is a well-known fact among my friends and I that uh, schools in Upper New York State have always received more funding per student than schools in within New York City, despite the condition of New York City schools and their need for academic improvement. Um, it's always been a concern of, for my friends and I. I know you mentioned it earlier about the uh, the formula that they use for deciding where the funding goes, but is this really a strong matter of concern for the assembly? And why has it only recently become an issue? Why did it take a court decision to really bring it to the table? Well, it's, it's an excellent question and, and a viewpoint that I share with you. Uh, yes, it's of major concern to us, has been for some time. Uh, there are political interests here that we have to respect. We in the Assembly agree with you, agree with the court case, that more money should be spent on those districts that are classified as poor. And again, it's just not New York City. Uh, some of my school districts are, are poor. And I don't think we've gotten our fair share. The Assembly is more attuned to that, to helping cities in those areas that are poor. Uh, the Senate, on the Republican side, is a little more concerned with money to suburban districts, because politically, that's where their support is. 
but and also from their standpoint, we understand the real their, their constituents, their voters, spend a great deal more money to support their schools than some other areas, and they have a legitimate concern if their taxpayers are paying real property taxes of six and seven thousand dollars a year because they want to spend more for their schools. They've got a political problem to help them address that need too. So it's not easily good guys and bad guys, it's different political needs. So we've been trying to address that, trying to target some more funds to those districts that are more in need, but it's a negotiated process with us and with the Senate and with the governor to arrive in a dollar amount and how to spread out those funds. Uh, and there are legitimate concerns of the Senate, as I'm trying to say, as fair as I can be, and concerns that we have. So that's how it's progressed. Um, now the court case is a wake-up call and uh, need is paramount regardless of other political considerations and that will have to be addressed. We just can't take money away from some suburban school district saying, you know, Terrytown you're getting too much or Chappaqua. Well, I'm paying $10,000 a year on school taxes. I'm willing to pay more than I, the state should help us support a, a better system. So we can't take to my hometown, for example, which is not very wealthy either. Um, so we've got to balance that out to make sure the poor districts get more in re response to the court decision without pulling out money and letting lay teachers get laid off in some other areas. That's a challenge. How are we going to do it? I have no idea. <laughs> But it'll get done, it has to get done. It does, it and has. need and poverty indexes yeah. are paramount by the court decision. It's an important point that upstate school districts also, as you say, um, have had the same problems uh, that we've experienced here in New York City. That, that's something that is not as well understood or acknowledged. You know, and in it's a America. smaller scale, but it's poor the, too. Yeah, sure. You know, the, the need uh, is there, sure. I mean, I have the ethnic diversity, of course, but it's poor. Uh, and school lunch programs, I don't make mention, you mm -hmm. know, the measure of poverty, it's there. And whether it's upstate or downstate, we've got to address it. Uh, it's got to be addressed. Part of the problem in the city is that as we've given more money, the mayors through the years have reduced the city's commitment to education. And that's not fair either. You know, we're not sending dollars to New York City school system to enable the city of New York to save money, that should supplement what the state's doing. And that does not happen upstate. You know, if we give more money to a school district, uh, the school district commitment stays the same. This is a different system here, but we're not in the business of putting more money into the school system in New York to enable the mayor to pocket that money and spend it more on roads. That's not the way it should be. So we've tried to get what we call hold harmless agreement by putting into law, if we send extra dollars to the city of New York school system, the city of New York must spend X number of dollars on their own and keep that steady and not reduce it in reliance upon our money that's coming, that's uh, being sent to the school system. That's another political issue, which is a serious one. Yes. Hi, my name is Salma Ragunath and I'm a student at City College and my major is English. I hope to someday be become a teacher or a lawyer, <laughs> one or the other. Um, the question that I have is that you mentioned earlier on in the program that the state keeps reducing the amount of money towards the CUNY school system, but while increasing the tuition, and therefore the school has to rely heavily on, tu on tuition instead of the state funds. Um, if this trend continues, where do you think you'll see CUNY schools in about 10 years from now or in the future? Well, I don't think we can allow that trend to continue. Mm -hmm. I really don't, because it makes the administrator's jobs much more difficult. And and it's very hard, although the chancellor's done an excellent job on raising private funds, but a lot of corporations and others do not want to give easily money to a publicly supported school system, you know, whether it's CUNY or SUNY. That's government's role. Why should I? So it's very difficult uh, to raise private dollars. So that trend, I don't think, can't continue, or else the quality and the program suffer, and so do the students. We've got to get back to a position where the state dollars are there and uh, rely less on the tuition to operate uh, the educational programs that we have. Okay, thank you. That's, but it's a, it's a bad trend that we have to reverse it. Incrementally, not overnight, but doing something to reverse that. Right. Yes. Um, hi, I'm Harban Irana. I go to Brew College and I plan to major in finance and investments. Uh, my question is more on the lighter side of things. 
How do you manage your work life with your personal life? Your work life sounds really thorough and time consuming. So how do you manage to do That's that? That's a problem. That's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's difficult. Public service uh, is all consuming, and sometimes the personal life uh, has to, suffers a little bit, and so does family life. It's hard because. Not only do we do at the Capitol uh, and our political, you know, our everyday life in session, which does not last all year, thank God, but uh, during the week and weekends we have functions. And uh, it's nothing. I did seven last weekend. It was a relatively light weekend Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, just doing things. Seven. Seven uh, events on last weekend. Last weekend. Um, and that. Um, I'll sometimes do 12 or 13. Uh, I'm trying to back off a little bit, but I feel, one, it's important to get out. You feel an obligation to some things, you must go. And secondly, it's important to learn and get the feel for the community and the groups that are out there. And the feedback uh, that I get is important politically for help for the re-election, but more importantly, substantively, in terms of doing the job. But it's hard. The summer is better, uh, and, and there's less, but once Labor Day hits, whew, it starts again, and uh, parades, the outings, and the functions increase. And during legislative night, when we're in the assembly, when we're in session in Albany, I'll do six or seven legislative receptions a night. Uh, either the Teamsters Union will be in, or uh, the university professors will be up, or different groups, and nurses, the medical society will be You'll do those, you'll visit, you'll talk to some people in your own district about issues that affect them in that particular area. And not only do you do session, have session all day into the evening, but then have those legislative receptions. It's long, it's long days. But most of it's very gratifying and satisfying, so it works out, pays off. Thank you. You're welcome. It's good also to use the dictum of living a balanced life, which we all try to do, but these jobs are very demanding, and yours in particular with all the social uh, engagements that you have and obligations to the Air Conference. It's, um, you must be pulled in many, many different directions. It is, but you have to like what you're doing. You know, and if you're thinking of careers, you know, th really think that through. And you're in a position to learn and grow now. But uh, liking your work, it affects your personal life, too, to be you know, not that happy with what you're doing every day. That's, that's hard. I was with the government for a while in Washington, D.C. as a lawyer right after law school. And it was a great city and a lot of fun. But, and I took a chance doing what I did because I just quit the job one day. I said, that's it. <laughs> this is okay, but not the way I want to spend my life. Uh, and it was a, it was a good move. Um, but just but when you enjoy what you're doing, you grab a hold of it, the days go by quickly, and hopefully you do some good things for people along the way. Well, you do very good things along the way. Yes. Hi, I'm Christy Puchko from Brooklyn College. Uh, I intend to be a filmmaker. And um, my question for you is admittedly controversial. Um, you mentioned that you yourself chose to go to private schooling over the public schools in your area. Um, I had a similar situation where the public schools where I lived were not very good, so my parents scra scraped together and I went to private school. Um, because of that, because of the fact we mentioned that public schooling is getting so little money, and, and the front of the Times today said that 40 percent of schools nationwide are not meeting standards of the U.S. Uh, school system. Considering all that, are you for or against the idea of school vouchers? I'm against the idea of school vouchers, and I think <clears throat> it'll undermine our educational system even more so. Um, and I don't like the idea of charter schools. I voted against the establishment of charter, charter schools in the country, in our state. Um, we have them now. Hopefully they'll work. Um, but I don't think there's any great secret to what makes a difference. It's money in, in the schools. If we had smaller class sizes, uh, I think you'd see uh, performance change dramatically. Uh, if, if facilities were in better condition across the state, um, I think it would affect performance as well. And it's just not all money. Obviously, the home is important, and the values and uh, the importance of education at a young age is critical. But um, I think vouchers and charter schools are an attempt to avoid the issue uh, and take a corporate approach 
to something which is a governmental issue, and if the resources are there, um, I think uh, we can have the performance that we, as the wealthiest nation in the world, uh, should be able to meet. Then what would be your, like, But vouchers enabling what the public should pay for me to go to a private school, I think, is, is, is laughable. Not everyone has that chance to go to a private school, uh, and if um, they want to go, they should be able to pay for it, as opposed to the state supporting it. Where is the money going to come from if we enable people to take vouchers and go to any school they want to, under various plans and configurations of vouchers? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I have a church state issue with it, which bothers me a great deal, um, and I, I, I think it'll further undermine our school system, our, our a teaching process and tenure and those things that are important to have a, an educated uh, professional teaching staff uh, and I think it's a short cut and, and I don't think it'll work. I'm against them. Okay. You can tell. Yes. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, my name is Catherine McCarthy and I'm a freshman at Hunter College. Um, I'm actually thinking of majoring in politics and so I was wanting to ask you, um, it, it sounds like there are a lot of daunting uh, tasks and responsibilities that you face, what kind of advice would you give to someone my age who's interested in politics? Well, I think it's important to learn a lot and study hard, do well, get good grades in terms of whether going to graduate school or law school. I think first things first, uh, and as students, you have the chance to learn and grow, and that's important. Secondly, getting involved in your community. Um, I got involved in a campaign, as I said, even back when I was in high school. Um, doing, doing little things like passing out literature, and, but that continued during, in fact, when I quit my job in Washington, I joined a campaign in 72, the McGovern-Shriver campaign that led nowhere, but I learned a lot. Uh, but getting involved in the community, grassroots things, if someone's interested in a political career, that's where to go. Um, and I went back to my hometown, and I'd been away for a while, but got involved and developed some issues and ran for mayor. It was a tough race. But getting involved is the way to do it. Um, learn a lot and getting involved and do some things, go for it. It's exciting. And you're in a wonderful place because you have a great political science department at Hunter and fabulous professors. So you're in a, you're in a good place. Thank you. Okay. Further questions? I'll just one of the other things uh, I do before the next question mm -hmm. was mentioned. I coach the Democratic Assembly Campaign Committee. On the political side, uh, we raise funds and do political strategy work uh, to keep Democrats in my party in the assembly and continue to get reelected. So that's one thing we do not in the government buildings. That's illegal, but um, one of the responsibilities I have is one of the exciting ones. Uh, go across the state developing mm -hmm. candidates to run for office, making sure they have the resources in districts that are tough for us to win, Republican or suburban areas some places. Um, and that's one of the things I do uh, on behalf of the Speaker, which is raising money, but also strategizing to win races on the political side. That's fun, too. You'd like that. <laughs> yes. Hi, my name is um, Ujuka Ubi AEC. I'm at City College and I'm a biochemistry major. I intend to be a doctor. So you talk about quitting your job at Washington. So I was um, intrigued. I wanted to know the branch of law you practice and what made you actually leave law. I know you were interested in politics, but what actually made you um, leave practicing law? Well, it was a tough decision. Uh, when I was in Washington, I was uh, in communications and administrative law. I got the job right out of college, right out of law school. And I'd interned uh, under President Johnson with the internship program. So I wanted to go back to Washington uh, and get involved in government at that level. What I found was you're involved at one level, but it's not really where the people are. You know, you're in a, it's a different thing altogether. So I thought um, it wasn't for me. So I just quit, got involved in the campaign, the campaign I was hired for. Uh, enabled me to, they signed, they signed me upstate. I could go, go, to, go to Chicago or upstate New York to help coordinate the campaign. I chose to go upstate, and when I did, coordinating the campaign in four counties, I realized this is really where my heart was, and I'd go back home. So I practiced law there, 
but then got involved politically in my hometown as a lawyer. They needed someone to, uh, for lawsuits and political stuff going on. Yeah. Um, I got involved with them in my hometown uh, and thought law is exciting, but in government as a mayor uh, it was more exciting. So I stopped that. But without law, I couldn't have had that access and exposure that enabled me to run initially uh, as I did back in 1975. Thank you. Last question. Hi, my name is Felina, and I go to Brooklyn College, and I'm majoring in history. And can you please tell me who determines the CUNY budget and what factors go into it? Wow. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> well, we rely, number one, on the trustees of CUNY um, to send up the budget report, reports and recommendations, and then we in the legislature make our decisions with the governor as to how much should be allocated. We made, the governor made some major cuts this year in community college base aid. We put all that money back in. The governor eliminated step and C-step programs that help students. We put all the money back in. Reduced by half uh, SEEK program and other opportunity programs. We put that money back in as legislature. So eventually, it's our responsibility at the state level in a working relationship with uh, the Board of Trustees as well, both with CUNY and SUNY as well. Okay. The, budget, uh, the budget process begins at the university. Uh, the chancellor is responsible for coordinating efforts that ultimately come forward with a recommendation to the Board of Trustees. And typically the Board of Trustees, because they are part of the process, will approve the request. Then it goes to the governor and the governor's people use that request in terms of generating their own recommendations and those recommendations then are deliberated by the assembly and the senate and ultimately it's the legislature that will pass a budget and uh, I can say that Ron Canistrari and Shelley Silver uh, the um, two gentlemen who are in the top leadership roles of, uh, of the Assembly have been indefatigable uh, in their efforts to assist the university and uh, it's really a pleasure for us to work with you in your new capacity as uh, chairman of the Higher Education Committee and Shelley Silver has always been a deep and uh, unbridled supporter uh, of the university and has been there for us. So. I thank you for that question, and I thank you, Ron, for being with us today. It was a, a splendid hour of getting to, uh, for you to know our students and for they to get to know you and, and our audience to meet uh, the man who uh, heads up this effort in higher education for the Assembly. It's just been a pleasure, and thank you for being with us, and thank you, audience, for spending time with us at CUNY Honors. Um, we look forward to seeing you next time.